Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Wednesday evening Bible study, Revelation, explaining, explaining all the scary stuff. And, and somebody here two weeks ago or more asked, where is this scary stuff going to hit? If we get far enough into this chapter, you better be scared. Except then you should be confident in the Lord helping you. Uh, but this is a totally different message than what a lot of churches will preach. Especially my good buddy, Joe Olstein. He's never studied Revelation. There's some hard stuff in here. The kind of suffering that we see happening in other areas of the country to Christians. Don't think that, that can happen here. Maybe we just haven't lived long enough. But through it all, the Lord is with us. And no matter what happens in this world, you won't have to experience any of it in eternal life. The more we're prepared for it now, the better off we'll be. I wish I could preach to you a different message. If I was to preach like my buddy Joel Olstein preached, we would have to expand the church two and three times over, except it wouldn't be God's word. It'd be a lie. He's never been to seminary. He's not a pastor. <laughs> yep. As All right. <laughs> let's, uh, let's take this to the Lord in prayer because I certainly need his help and I imagine you do too. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Maybe some of us here have experienced some hard times today. Maybe we will tomorrow and the next day, but confirm in our hearts that you're always there through the good times, through the bad times, through the hard times. Help us always give glory to you. When we feel weak, when we feel down, when we feel put upon, help us to turn to you to find the answer, to find the strength, to remember all of that your son went through he knows what suffering is about. He knows what temptation is about. And he promises to walk with us and to help us and to lift us up. Jesus, be that in each one of our lives today and going forward. Lord, in your mercy. Your yes. Yes. Heavenly Father, be with Ruth and Karen as they continue their chemo treatments. We ask that these things would result in their complete restoration to health. Walk with them through these treatments. Keep their bodies and their spirits strong. Uh, be with their loved ones who stand by their side. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you. Be with our brother, Jim Burr, who's uh, been moved to ICU with uh, his kidneys shutting down. Lord, bring healing into this man's life. Help them to find the, uh, the, the, uh, the cure and, and, and the medicine that can help him. Keep him strong in his faith. Be with Emily and his family at home as they were. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. <laughs> Lord God, be with all those who are suffering extreme weather conditions, California, Texas, and other places. Keep people safe. Bring an end to these severe weather conditions and those first responders and road crew and those that come behind and help out. Grant them the ability to care for the people of that nation, of that state, and of that area. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, be with Jack as he... Uh, Give him strength through his cancer treatments. Uh, work on his appetite. Grant him an increased appetite and give him relief from his pain. Lord, in your mercy. Your Lord God, be with Kathy's daughter, Joanna, who's given three to six weeks to live. Grant comfort for her. And because we can ask for anything, we ask that you would extend her life for much longer. But however long you give her, may she give all grace and glory to you. May she look to Jesus as the answer to her fears and to the hope of eternal life to come. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for our brother Mike and for Patches and the great gift that he's been uh, in, in Mike's life. We're thankful that you were able to grant uh, Patches successful cataract treatment. Be with him going forward and be with our brother Mike. We're so happy to have him here. Watch over and care for him and Patches. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. <laughs> Lord God, be with Kathy, who's recovering from a stroke and is paralyzed on the left side of her body. Grant uh, that her she that that paralysis might be lifted, and whatever your will is for her, help her to cope with life moving forward. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, be with uh, Mary as she goes through radiation treatments and uh, healing for bone cancer. Keep her strong in her body, soul, and spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen. Lord God, be with our sister, Linda, who will be traveling home uh, this coming week. Grant her safe travels home and that she can be here to uh, play uh, on the organ for us in worship. 
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, be with uh, Ron's daughter-in-law, Karen, who has bronchitis. Grant her complete health and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, be with me and with Pastor Dave. Grant us continued healing of body, soul, and spirit. Lift us up and provide us for the strength that we don't have, especially those days that look dark and we feel down. Be, be the comforter in our life that the Holy Spirit has come to be. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, I give you thanks uh, uh, on behalf of Ron and Karen uh, for their good results they received from their kidney doctor. We ask that that would continue, their kidneys would continue functioning optimally. Uh, and we thank you that you've uh, taken them this far. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, be with uh, Dale Norrington. We ask that he has good results uh, from his doctor tomorrow as far as his cancer. Be with Allison, his daughter. Yeah, she recovers from a procedure where she quit breathing in the middle of it. She's worried, Lord. Grant her the comfort and strength to know that you were with her and you're the reason she's still here now. Restore her completely to health. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we give thanks to you for the gift of live stream. Uh, you showed us what a gift that is this past Sunday when people couldn't show up because of the weather and they they joined on live stream. We ask, we thank you for that gift and ask that uh, we would encourage people to use it not as a replacement for in-person worship, but for those times when we can't be here so that we can join together as one body in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, be with a young lady who's suffering from painful conditions and is experiencing trauma and difficulty in her life. Grant her calmness, grant her peace, grant her hope. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, we ask that you would be with us as a congregation as we meet this coming Sunday. We ask that you would bless that meeting and it would serve to draw us together as the one body in Christ's admission for him. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, we thank you for the seasonal weather we've had. And it's going to get cold here, but we ask that you would be with and protect all those that are don't have heat, don't have a place to live. Grant them a warm shelter. Grant them hope, comfort, and strength. Lord, we pray for the return of seasonable weather. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, yeah. Lord God, be with Heather as she uh, experiences spinal surgery. Uh, we, we give thanks that it was successful to remove a tumor, but use radiation and whatever means to uh, get rid of the rest of that tumor and restore her completely to health. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah, Lord God, be with uh, all of those in Memphis, the police officers and law enforcement, and just with the people. Uh, if they're going to demonstrate, Lord, encourage them to do it peacefully. You are a God of peace and you control all things. Protect those that must protect others and serve with law enforcement. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, be with Dale as he recovers from heart surgery in the hospital and we ask that that recovery would be complete and without any complications to restore him completely to health. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Lord God, be with our sister, Connie Rao. Grant her continued healing from her surgery and uh, help her as she lives now down in Arizona this first year without Joe. Grant her comfort when she's in the midst of mourning, your peace and hope. Bring people from her church down there to comfort her. Ex help us to extend ourselves from here to provide her the same comfort. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord God, be with Betsy. Help her to, to, to uh, be able to control and manage her diabetes correctly. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And Lord God, be with my brother, Reverend Art, and his wife, Joel. Provide watchful care for both of them, her in, uh, in the nursing home and Reverend Art here. Be with them and comfort them in all of their worries. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. All of these things we commend over into your care, gracious Father. Trusting in your love for each one of us and all God's people respond. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, <clears throat> we turn to our, uh, our worksheet, our note page, our study sheet, whatever the heck you want to call it. We're going to start off with a recap of chapter 12, which is on there, which I will read through for you. Follow along. So in the last chapter, chapter 12, we saw this was all highly symbolic, right? Yeah. So when we talk about things we shouldn't imagine, literally what they say, but we look for the meaning behind that. John is speaking in uh, word pictures to people in the first century AD, 
So we are out of that context. We need to walk through and see it through their eyes to understand what these symbols mean to them. He's also writing apocalyptically <clears throat> in case that this uh, letter, it was a letter originally, might be uh, uh, intercepted by Rome because a lot of these things point right to Rome. And if you're Rome and somebody's writing bad about you, what are you going to do with this letter? Go after them. Rip it up and kill the messenger. Back then, they didn't have email. They didn't have carbon copy. There was only one copy, and somebody made copies from that. So John wrote in ways that the church would understand, but nobody outside the church would. Hence, we have all of these symbolism. So with that in mind, chapter 12, we saw a woman giving birth, and she represented the Old Testament church. Uh, for whom and from whom the prophetic promise of the Messiah was given and declared. Specifically, this woman represents Mary, so the child, the Savior. That's who she gave birth to, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The dragon is symbolically represents Satan. We see that in the Old Testament. In Genesis, it was a serpent that tempted Adam and Eve. And what is the dragon but a big, huge, scary serpent? <clears throat> Satan tries in various ways throughout the Old Testament and the life of Jesus to prevent this child from being born, from growing up to be the sinless Savior, and then finally to squash this movement, which was the 12 disciples following him and believing in him as their Savior. Satan did his worst, moving sinful men to put Jesus to death. But this, as well as all other evil plans, only served to further the will of the Father that the son should die and be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. So Satan's words plays right into God's hand. That will always be the case. Satan tries his darkness to hurt Christ, and he can't because Christ is powerful. He's the creator. So he tries to hurt Jesus' most precious thing, which is us, believers. But even then, all he can do that will hurt you physically, emotionally, and spiritually Christ uses for your ultimate good. <clears throat> so, uh, Satan causes the best to happen to Jesus, which is he dies and becomes our Savior. Then the resurrected mm -hmm. Jesus, after announcing his victory over Satan, was caught up or ascended to the right hand for the ruling power of the Father on the throne. With our Savior present before the throne of God, advocating on our behalf, Satan had no place to operate as our accuser. That's what he always did. Satan means the accuser. He loved to accuse us of our sins and therefore say, that guy, Pastor Mark, he's a sinner. He's mine. But since Jesus' death and resurrection left us with no sins to be accused of, Satan and the demons, uh, uh, they have no place in you. Satan and the demons didn't want to depart. So in, <clears throat> in chapter 12, it describes a war. And this is a spiritual war. So you should never think of that war as being with tanks and guns and arms or hand to hand. It's best thought of as a war of words, like a lawyer's in a courtroom, where God's angels, led by the archangel Michael, cast Satan out from before the presence of Christ on the throne, convincing him because of all that Jesus has done for us, he's got no place to accuse believers anymore. He was cast to earth where he has tried to destroy the church through various means, as we saw in chapter 11. Some of these involve physical attacks on churches around the world. Other ways are through the proclamation of false gospels. But God protects the church and provides for its continued existence, just as he protected his Old Testament church, Israel, in the 40-year wandering, 40 wandering in the wilderness. The church today finds itself living in a world that is not its home, kept safe by faith, waiting for Christ's return and our own resurrection into the eternal paradise to come. Satan is furious over his failed attempts to destroy the church, so he directs his attention instead on individual believers. So <clears throat> now we come to chapter 13, and I have a little title underneath here. It's called The Dragon and His Two Beasts. This is some of the more well-known parts of Revelation. You hear about the beasts. 666, this is it, people. This is our beast with 666. This is the chapter that deals with it. Uh, unable to destroy the church, the dragon who is Satan conjures up two beasts that he will use to spiritually and physically attach the church, attack, attach, attack believers, to move them to give up their faith through physical and spiritual persecution. So let's begin by reading Revelation chapter 12, 17. It should be the last verse in chapter 12. 
and then we'll enter into chapter 13 and read up until the 10th verse. And the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to take war, to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Okay, round or somebody else read through chapter 13 uh, through uh, verse 10. I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diademons on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against them? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemous against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life, the lamb that was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to the captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword, must he be slain. And here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Very good. Mm. Any scary stuff in there? And it really lasts for 42 months. Is any any number literal in Revelation? <laughs> no. Symbolic. It's all figurative, and, and we will explain that when we get to that point. All right, let's look at uh, that last verse of chapter 12. The dragon became furious with the woman, went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. In this verse, how are the offspring of the woman described? Eagle eagles. Eagles. Two great eagles. Now, how are they described in this verse here, verse 17? Those who keep the commandments of God. Those who keep the commandments of God and obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now we know what do we know about the offspring of the woman? Who did we say that was from chapter 12? Jesus. Us. Us. When we look at her as the church, the Old Testament church, her offspring is the New Testament church. From the Old Testament church came the 12 apostles. From the 12 apostles came, came the church, Jewish and Gentile. And we are the people who keep the commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Why is that a good fit description for believers? Let's look at the second part, hold to the testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Bible. Can you give me that in a, in a, a real quick summary on a non-Christian? What's the testimony of Jesus? I don't know anything about it. What do I need to know about Jesus? He'd suffer and die for our sins. Yes, which makes him my Savior. What happened to all my sins? He rose again. What does that mean to me? That I'll, re I'll be resurrected too. Remember what Peter, Peter, the testimony of the rock that the church was built on. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. You, this man standing in front of me completely human or divine. 
Son of God before all eternity. Christ, the anointed one, the promised Messiah, who came to die and rise again to forgive us all our sins, to defeat our worst enemies, which are sin, Satan, and death. And we hold to that testimony, no? That's what separates us from the world. What about the commandments? Do we keep the commandments? Yes. yes They're a, a, a mirror, a rule, and a guide, as Paul Catechism says. Ah, excellent, Reverend Art. Yep. We keep that's how we keep them. Rule, mirror, and guide. What is the rule? What does the rule do? Or the curb, actually, I've heard it described. What does a curb do? Keeps you from straying and keep you know, keep you from going straight. So the commandments, they work that way for believers and unbelievers. <laughs> living civilly so we don't kill each other long enough so the church can do its business. A mirror, how do the commandments operate as a mirror? They show, us our, our sin. Sin. show us our sins, show us who we are. But God's word doesn't just show us who we are as a sinner, it shows me who we are in faith, right? Yes. And as a guide, how do they operate as a guide? The more rule we won't say Law. It's still law. We call it the third use. And where that comes in is, I know I'm forgiven of all my sins. I want to live now in love and obedience to Christ who saved me. How do I do that? What does it mean to obey Christ? Try to keep his commandments. Love God and love others. What does it mean to love God? Have no other gods before him. Don't blaspheme his name. Worship only him. What does it mean to love others? Don't commit adultery, don't cheat, don't lie, don't steal, help people protect their stuff. That's what the commandments do for us. That's them operating as a guide. Shows us how we love God and how we love others. But even though it operates as a guide for us, being forgiven Christians, it still always, always operates as a mirror. It always shows us our sin because we cannot live out that third use perfectly. But we are always forgiven. Always. And because of that forgiveness, we can use the law as a guide. Because every time we fail, Christ forgives us, he picks us up, go out, try again. Okay, well, that's who we are. Next question Where is the dragon left standing in this verse? I just. Sand of the sea. On the sand of the sea. Which is a kind of symbolic or poetic way of saying he's standing looking out onto the sea, isn't he? At the shore. All right. What does the sea symbolize according to that bookmark I gave you? Evil human government. There we go. So Satan is looking over the governments of the world, those that do not believe in Christ. Don't follow his commands and work against it. And he's plotting. He's plotting because he couldn't prevent the church from being born, the New Testament church, couldn't touch the Savior, and now he's going after individual believers, and he's going to use evil government. human governments to try and tempt and persecute us. Questions up until now? Are you with me? Yep. All right. Let's look at the first couple of verses of chapter 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast I saw was like a leopard, its feet like a bear, its mouth like a lion, its mouth, and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Kind of sounds like John's been smoking something, doesn't it? <laughs> that's for, that's to us and, and we don't have the knowledge of the old testament that people in john's day did that was their bible so we will look to the old testament and figure out why all of these things describe a beast but first of all uh one of the notes i have here uh we see dangerous beasts or wild animals as creatures who have the power to hurt or kill defenseless people in apocalyptic literature, a beast would represent an evil force that attacks believers to maim and destroy without mercy. So there's why John says he sees a beast. That's what is behind it. A force that wants to hurt, kill, and maim Christians and has no mercy. 
you can find more merciful things than wild animals than this. A lot of wild animals, when you stop fighting, they'll walk away unless they're hungry. This beast will not. So a beast with 10 horns and seven heads rising from the sea, conjured up by the dragon. Remember that. This is something that the dragon brings into existence. And the dragon is who? Satan. 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 <clears throat> Using your bookmark, what is being symbolized here? What is the relationship to the dragon? So we have a beast, evil forces controlled by Satan, rising from the sea, rising from what? Evil human government. Human government. And, it's, and But not just government, institutions. Those that are supposed to help and assist us as agents of God's rule in the secular temporal realm. Not just governments, human institutions. We'll get on that more. Uh, what is the relationship uh, to the dragon of this beast? Well, men worship. Let's, uh, let's look at Revelation 12, 3. Somebody want to read this? Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. When we first encounter Sagan, he's Satan, he's a great red dragon. He has seven heads and ten horns. What does this beast have? Seven, seven, seven heads horns. and ten horns. Ten horns. <laughs> What's the relationship of this beast to the dragon? Satan. This beast was conjured by Satan and is controlled by him. These human, these human institutions operate as his hand in the world. And they don't even know it, but they are. These are governments and institutions the dragon has taken control of and they serve him to attack believers. So ten horns. What do horns represent as far as your bookmark goes? Power. All. Power. All power. So these human institutions and governments will have all power. They'll be they'll rule uncontested over people. How about heads? What does the number seven mean? The words of God can do and either. The words God alone can do and, and either does or he has done. So we talked about heads being a symbol of intelligence. These human institutions will have all the intelligence they need and act like they have the intelligence of knowing as much as God knows uh, to carry out their deeds. Satan will give them that knowledge. Of course, since this comes from Satan, can we believe that? No. Can we believe that these institutions actually have all God's knowledge no. or his power? No. No, Satan is a liar, and these things are a lie, but that's what people will be led to believe. These governments and institutions may think their plans and purposes are carried out by their own design, but they're actually motivated, designed, and carried out by Satan and his demons. He plants the thoughts in their head. He moves them to act. And as we said before, he will be, in a lot of cases, merciless. Okay, we've got 10 diadems. On the horns, if uh, if if uh, a diadem or a crown represents power and ability to rule, what do these mean? Horns mean power. Crowns uh, mean power to rule. Ten means all complete. Put it together. You're going to drive a star. Complete authority and power to rule uncontested. Notice, though, in, in this beast, uh, the crowns are not on their heads, but on their horns. And that means the power they have to rule is not their own. It comes from Satan. He gives it, and he can take it away. These governments and institutions will think they operate on their own power. They do not. And if they stop serving Satan and his schemes, he'll get rid of them and move on to something else. So, Pastor, so when, when we say Satan and as, as an accuser, yes, maybe I'm just 
thinking it was different, but the version of the dead one? when we we accuse every day of whatever, is that kind of falling in? Is, <clears throat> is that something that would make the Satan happy? If we accusatory we, of good, bad, or different. If we accuse others, yes. Wrongly, yes. If, if we accuse others and don't want to forgive them, oh heck yes. If we accuse others and yet try to work it out and forgive them, that's not what Satan wants. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's an expression of the gospel. That's well, an expression of you know, the gospel. And I'm obviously look at it for the right word, but it's just when we accuse somebody, and yet it's true. Oh. Now, how does how is that is is that a little bit different than what kind of this is here? Is it? It's... You're, you're you're speaking from the point of view of government or ruling institutions, and God, those are good. God gave those to us to be <laughs> on earth. Uh, we'll read that coming up in Romans uh, 13. It talks about how God, gov good government is God's gift to keep the peace. peace. Laws are good to help keep the peace. We are to obey government as long as they don't tell us to do something that stands against God's rule and command. At that point, as Christians, we refuse to obey. But the court system, people that have committed a crime, you go to court, you're accused, and it's proved guilty, then discipline and punishment is due. And sometimes that discipline and punishment might be the chair. If it's bad enough. So you don't want to see what that we, he's the accused say, you know, that's the meaning. And, you know, just like, you know, you did this or you didn't do that. Mm -hmm. We're kind of, we're falling in line with what he wants, even though we don't try to. Not as a government, no. That's okay. When we're, when we're working and, and above board, mm -hmm. when we're accusing somebody and we have proof and it's good, right, and salutary, then we're being instruments of God to keep the peace. Even with God's rules and commands, if you violate them, there's punishment. Except God's rule and command, the punishment is not years in prison, it's eternal separation from God. And Christ suffered that for us. Now, if I was to kill somebody, I'm a Christian, does that mean I don't go to jail? If I did it, you would accuse me, you would try me, you find me guilty. I either go to jail for life or I might even lose my life. But where am I going to be for eternity if I'm still a Christian and I have faith? Repent of it and be I'll be restored. restored. Yeah. You know, you see, God, well, that's well, what well, I well. used to tell the prisoners. I said, uh, after we got done with our confession and absolution, I would say, now God forgives you this crime, but the state of Michigan does not, and you're going to be punished. They will be, I are being punished. They were in big prisons up north. I told them God can forgive you, and they were very well pleased with that. But they knew they had the punishment coming. I answer your question? Yeah, just but in that same point then, just to go one step further, you kill somebody, but yet it was quote unquote justifiable. You still killed someone. How was that, you know, how was that? Well, it would be in a court of law, would I be tried for first degree murder then? It's justified. And, and you were proven innocent of you know, it's, it's, If I'm proven innocent, then I uh, I'm I'm acquitted. Right. But I don't go to yeah. So you know, I just, it just when I see the hear the accuser, I just it's like yeah. you know, how do we Satan is accuser in a bad way? Okay. But, uh, lawyers in a court of law can be accusers in a good way. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Moving on. Uh, if the head is the seat of intelligence, what does it mean that blasphemous names were written upon these heads of this beast? What is blasphemy? Lies. Yep, and it's specifically in, in a in a biblical sense, telling lies about who? Jesus. Great. God. Jesus. <laughs> lies about who he is, about his grace and forgiveness. <laughs> lies about Jesus being our savior. But also people that claim to be God or have the power of God or to be from God or speaking for God that do not. Those are all lies directed at God, and they're all blasphemy. So what does it mean that these heads, which is the seat of intelligence, have blasphemous names written on? What's inside my head here? 
Maybe right. nothing for me, but what's inside your head? Right. Not much. It, it's the seat of knowledge, right? It's where I think. Blasphemy is written on the head is uh, ruling officials who uh, have the mission of defaming and abusing what we stand for, our confession of faith, our doctrines, our beliefs, our scriptural truths. Trying to feed us blasphemy, which is tell us those things are false. This can include not only calling them false and trying to prove them false, but changing or altering them so that the gospel is corrupted. As good Lutherans, one of the things we hold fast to are the small catechism, our Lutheran confessions, because they represent the truths of scripture. It would be going in and changing those. Oh, you know what? This thing Luther said about by grace through faith, it's not really right. We got to put in there by grace through faith. We got to add and works. There's blasphemy against Christ. You say these people were unbelievers or not? They, these creatures are. The, well, government. it's human institutions, so they'll be human beings. Would be, well, we'll, we'll get to that. They could call themselves believers. Okay. They could present themselves as believers. Would Satan do that? Would he lie about being the church? Yeah. Oh, heck yeah. yeah. Doing that right now. Doing that right now. Good question. Verse two, what are the creatures from our reality? What are the creatures that we know of in this world that John uses to describe this beast? Name them off there. Leopard, bear, bear lion, lion, dragon. Okay. Like a leopard, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion's. What do you consider about all these animals? Who are they to humans, especially unprotected humans? Vicious, killers. They could kill you, couldn't they? Any yeah. one of them could kill you unless you unless you have some kind of a weapon. John is not just picking these out of thin air and he's not tripping. Uh, he's thinking back on something from the Old Testament, specifically from Daniel chapter 7. So I'll volunteer to read some verses from Daniel chapter 7. Daniel was uh, a important leader. He was a, a person in government in Jerusalem right before... Uh, Babylon came and destroyed and took people away. Actually, he was with the first movement that took him away. He was one of the bright, smart kids. He was young. And uh, so he came and he worked his way up and he became influential in the, in the, uh, in the kingdom of uh, Babylon for the king. He came, became an advisor for a king. Okay, <clears throat> with that in mind, go ahead and read these verses from Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream in vision of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up a great sea. Remember the winds of heaven? We had angels standing at the corners of the winds, going to destroy the earth. They're getting stirred up. So destruction is coming on a limited basis. The sea, evil human governments. And That's... four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. Oh. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then, as I looked at its wings, were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, the second, like a bear, was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, arise, devour much flesh. We'll pause here for a moment. This is one of the areas where people who read Revelation rather literally say, ah, a bear. Russia's in here. The Soviet Union. Oh, no. This had to mean something to the first century church. Russia didn't exist. Nobody knew about Russia. Nobody knew about communism. But people of Daniel's time did know about evil human governments. Remember, stirred up the sea? The sea back then meant evil human governments. So take a wild guess as to what these beasts in Daniel represent. 
evil human governments of Daniel's time. Yeah. Okay. So we've got two. Uh, Tom, I'll let you continue on. After this, I look, and behold, another, like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. <clears throat> and the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped out what was left was its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Daniel is talking about evil human governments that existed then or will exist. He's actually looking into the future. This is a prophetic vision for Daniel. <clears throat> we were doing a Bible study on Daniel. We could look back and see why actually all these descriptions are there. Suffice it to say that if we were to study Daniel, what you would find out is written in the note below. In Daniel's vision, the beasts are symbolic of world powers that will dominate and subdue God's people from the time Daniel was writing this book until the time when the Messiah would come. The first beast is Babylon. And then Babylon was conquered by Medo-Persia. Persia was conquered by Greece. This terrifying fourth beast is Rome. Daniel's looking forward. The only one that exists in Daniel's time is Babylon. They're ruling now. All the rest would come. Okay? In John's vision, he's got one single beast that is an amalgamation of all the three. He doesn't see four beasts because those three have already come and gone. But parts of them, especially the evil dominating part of them, is all found in the fourth terrifying beast, which is Each one of these world powers conquers the previous one and becomes more powerful than its predecessor. Power in what they can do, but especially power in the area they control. Rome was a huge empire, controlled far more than Greece, especially uh, Persia or Babylon before it. Our next uh, bullet point, why might the message regarding the relationship between the beasts of Daniel chapter 7 and the beasts from John, this John's vision? Uh, what might be the message regarding the relationship here? I think I just gave that to you. Rome is kind of an amalgamation of all of them. There's bits and pieces of the evil that they did in Rome, but Rome far went beyond any of the evil that any of these other empires did. It was exceedingly strong and terrifying. Who was in charge of Rome at that time? Uh, we believe the omniscient, the mission. He was the emperor that decided that, uh, unlike the other emperors, they all were made gods when they died. Uh, I believe it was Domitian said, no, nah, I'm a god now, worship me. Christian, you don't want to worship me? How about you die? How about I slather you with bacon grease and tie you to a post and let wild animals eat you? How about if I use you as a human candle? How about if I stake you out in the town? Or better yet, how about if I stake your family out in the town? Threaten to kill them unless you confess that you worship. He was a real bad dude. He was. That's why John is writing this letter. The church is undergoing severe persecution. Severe. Uh, like Daniel's fourth beast, Rome has uh, ten horns. It has a lot of power. It has the power of the whole known world, and it can dominate any part of that world at any time. It rules with an iron fist. Next note, you'll find this interesting. It's John sits on Patmos, which is an island, and he looks across the Aegean Sea to the west. He would be looking towards Italy. How would this strengthen the identity of John's beast from the sea? Be Rome, towards Rome. Yes. Rising up out of the Aegean Sea, if he could see far enough. Rome. He was looking at Rome. Rome, the fourth terrifying beast. There you go. What if, why doesn't he just write Rome in there? Why does he have to talk about beasts? Because oh, again, the leathers got captured then. Gone. 
be one thing if they killed John, but if they killed some message, we wouldn't have it today. What is John saying about the Roman Empire's ruling power and where that power comes from? It's powerful. Into the devil. It's an agent for the devil. Okay. What might modern day examples of the manifestation of this beast in, in human institutions be today? Think of some human institutions today that are kind of like that beast at work now. Are there any? Oh, sure. Let's hear them. Remember, these are these are human institutions that want to persecute Christians, want to prevent uh, Christ from being preached. Government. Getting emails of government. Institutions. Muslim nations. Mm. Bingo. Do we know Islamic countries that persecute Christians? Oh, yes. Yes. Bad oh, enough if you, can, if you confess Christ, they'll put you to death. Is that happening today? Yeah. Yes. That was Rome back in John's time. It's still going on today. Not here. We forget about it because it's not going on here. But it's going on. Give me some other institutions. So we've got Islam. The biggest one, Islam. Iran. Iran. Mm -hmm. Syria. Mm -hmm. Russia. Indonesia. Yep. North Korea. China. China. Those are all governments. Give me some human institutions. Give me some human institutions that are in this country that seem to be working against the church and what we proclaim to be true. Planned Parenthood. Yes. Planned Parenthood. What does Planned Parenthood promote? Abortion. Abortion. On demand, whenever you want it. And why do we as a church stand against that? Taken away. It's murder. It's murder in the womb against somebody that can't defend themselves. Guess who is that at at work? That's the beast. That's the beast at work. <clears throat> because not only do they want abortion on demand, how do they feel about us standing against it? They do not like us. Bad enough that when the Roe versus Wade got overturned, what happened to some churches? They got stolen. They got damaged. damaged. Stuff written outside, windows broken, demonstrations. Really, really stupid people. How about uh, how about our <laughs> schools and colleges and school boards that are pushing? The agenda for transgenderism, teaching children that it's okay and natural. Is that is that is that the beast at work? Yeah, I, I think the male teachers that are promoting that ought to have their anatomy changed. Not just males. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Duran Schools has put kitty litter in the bathrooms. So if you want to be a cat that day, you could go to the bathroom. Well, that's no problem. What if the kid wants to be a cat? Isn't that okay? Yeah. God created them male and female and then cats. So, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we laugh, but is, isn't, that, isn't that attacking God's original design of creation? Male and female. And we talked about this on the sermon on Sunday, how we're different. We've been given the image of God. We're not animals. Satan loves it. Nothing like dumbing your kids down. Nothing like turning them against God in subtle ways. Yeah. Higher education in general seems to be pushing an anti-Christ, anti-church agenda over and over again. Welcome to the beast at work. It's here now. And it's at work. Working subtly. Horizons have expanded. Even in the last five or ten years, they've expanded. Also, the institution of marriage. Yes. Yep. Jesus said, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. Well, Jesus forgot to mention man and a man. 
Adam and Eve and Steve. I guess they left Steve out. <laughs> but once again, I mean, you're you're talking down about God's created design, the basic building block for for social order, man and woman, family. Not anymore. And you know, it, it's single parents. Church needs to come alongside them and help them. I'm not speaking down about single single parents, but when we say that, that's okay. You don't need to be married. It's okay. It's not okay in God's. And the fact that it's not okay when we encounter single parents, we as the church need to step in and help. What about those groups that use they use violence, but in, in the Lord's name, like the KKK or Black Lives Matter? Oh, yeah. The beast. I didn't hear what he said. The KKK and other groups that use violence yet claim to be doing and speaking for God. Um, Black Lives Matter had pastors that supported them. Maybe still do. It's a criminal program there. Why not the idea of just changing, trying to change history instead of, you know, let's, you know, let's destroy us as a country. Pastor Martin. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Uh, well, what about that church? Church of Scientology. Yeah. They claim to be Christian. That's the beast. You better believe that's the beast. Nothing to do about Christ. They're very dangerous. They're a cult. Well, just just try it out a while ago. And I thought, well, just just try to join them and then try to leave. There's actually a great uh, yeah. special that was on Netflix yeah. uh, from two people. One's uh, she was uh, an actress. Remy. Um, yeah. Lisa yeah. Remy. Huh? Lisa Remy. Yeah, Lisa, Lisa Remy. Remy. Uh, I don't remember what it was called, but if you search Netflix, it's still there. The Church of Scientology. Yeah, they talk about it a lot. They it, you try to leave and they'll block you. Yeah. They'll ruin your life. You try to leave. They sent out. I, they sent out. Hitmen. Yeah. So they, they go after people, not just, you know, they mean money. They have a lot of money and they come across as a church. They're not taxed and they have a ton of money, a ton of real estate holdings. And they want all your being on the too. They do. Good. Uh, next bullet point. Well, the dragon, who is Satan, wants us to believe he has absolute power over believers. And at times it may even seem that way. Who is truly in control of the sea where this beast comes from and over the dragon himself? God. So let's talk about symbolism. Who in the Bible do we see controlling the sea? Right. I think Jesus. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Let's uh, read some things. This one is from Mark chapter four. Somebody want to read these verses? On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You think Christ may say that to us if we were fearful of what human institutions might do to us? So we stopped our confession of faith and changed what we believe and confess. You think he might say, why are you still afraid? Do you still have no faith? It's not just the literal sea that he controls. Let's look now in uh, Matthew 4, uh, this is verse 8 through 11. Again, this, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, 
for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Mm -hmm. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. The devil shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Since they're mine, I'll give them to you. Does Satan deal with, does, does Jesus deal with Satan? Does he what? Deal. deal with him. Does he make a deal? No. Don't have a deal. No. They're his. They're not yes. his to give. They're not Satan's to give. They still belong to God. Even though they fight against God and, and do things against his reign and rule, nobody can oppose God. He uses even their worst dastardly stuff to further his plan, which is that all believers will stand before Christ on the last day. The one who really controls all evil institutions and human, human government is this man. And what does he say to the dragon? Be gone. Be gone. And does it, can the devil stand around and continue to tempt him? No. Yes. He won't. <laughs> because here's the one that's really in control. And we want to keep that in mind as we study this chapter and think about evil human institutions and everything else that comes. Here's the one that's in control. So much so, all he has to say is, be gone. The devil has to stop. Good. Questions or comments up till now? Sounds like he was very tolerant of the uh, Satan boy. Who was tolerant? Jesus. Why do you think Satan was there? Why do you think uh, Jesus allowed Satan to tempt him for 40 days and 40 nights? Or did Jesus get overpowered? God. We'll, we'll talk about this in an upcoming sermon. It'll be a little while. But Israel was Jesus, wandering. Go ahead, Norman. I was going to say that Jesus is showing him that he is in control and not Satan. Yep. Israel wandered for 40 years in the desert, tempted by Satan and kept failing, accusing God lacking faith that God would care for them. They were tempted and failed for 40 years. Jesus symbolically is Israel condensed to one. He's in the wilderness 40 days in a worse situation as them with nothing to eat or drink and repeatedly defeats every temptation Satan threw at him. Defeated it for Israel and defeated it for you. You have eternal life because Christ won it for you with perfect obedience, tempted by Satan, and never gave in. It's important that we see this uh, Jesus temptation happening right after his baptism, right after the public announcement, this is the Messiah. A voice from God the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's perfect. He's anointed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus takes it to Satan in the wilderness. Let's go, Satan. Come on. I'll even make myself weak in my humanity. Come on. <laughs> Beats him every. Could there have been more temptations than this? There possibly might have been. Well, there was one where he told him to jump off the mountain. Yeah, I didn't include that one, but there's that, and then there's the turn bread into in, in stone in the bread. Yeah. Good. Any other comments or questions on this? So there's the first beast, human institutions conjured by Satan, rising out of evil human governments. The one that John sees is Rome. All other evil human governments, you could kind of say were spawned from Rome, have bits and pieces of Rome, learned evil from Rome. Let's uh, look now at verses three to eight. If you can see this, I don't know, the print's kind of small, but I needed to include all these verses on one page. Norma, would you like to read this for us? Sure. One of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. 
It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. Thank you, Norma. Start off with in verse three, one of its heads seems to have a mortal wound, but was healed. What might this mean? In John's day, they didn't have advanced medicine. If you got an injury to your head, how fatal do you think might it be? Yeah. Seems to have a mortal wound, seems to have died and rose again. Does that put you in mind of anybody? Christ. Read Revelation 5, verse 6, somebody. Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Did this lamb die? Yes. Yes. Three days in the tomb dead and rose again. This creature seems to have a mortal room, seems to have died. And there's the clue, seems to have died, not dead. Who was the devil? Does he tell the truth? No, he lies. He lies, he tries to put one over on you. Whatever this is, and we'll talk about it a little bit, it's the devil trying to put one over on people, trying to seem like Christ. What was, what was the promise in, in Genesis that he would bruise his head, but Satan would bruise his heel? Want to read it? Oh. <laughs> there you go. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat, all the days of your life, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. <clears throat> the offspring of Eve is Christ. That's the one promise. The offspring of Satan, demons. And you could also include evil human governments to do their bidding. But mainly this is aimed at Satan and his demons. How did the Satan and his demons bruise Jesus' heel? When did that happen? On the cross. Yes. Made him suffer. Made him die. Was that death eternal? No. no. On the last day when Jesus returns, how will he bruise Satan's head? How will he inflict a mortal wound on Satan? Throwing them to eternal death. eternal suffering and death, gone forever, an eternal dying. Satan will wish he could die. Can't suffer forever. I have a note on here. The Emperor Caligula became seriously ill once, but recovered. Emperor Nero began persecution of the church, but he committed suicide and stopped, only to see it revived again by the emperor that's in charge with when John is writing this, Emperor Domitian. Both of these can be examples of a partial fulfillment of this prophetic imagery. Let me see now. It can be a person, but it also can be a plan. You think about the evil of uh, Hitler in Germany. That only happened once, right? We never saw that happen anywhere else again, that kind of persecution of uh, it's happening right now. Happening right now, happened in Serbia, 
How many other places in the world have people been persecuted because of their race, their ethnicity? That didn't just go away. Many people thought it did when Hitler was conquered and Germany was conquered. It just sprung up somewhere else. That's a prophetic fulfillment of what's we're being talked about here. Evil human institutions rising again, different name, same thing though. So what might be modern day examples of this? I mentioned Hitler and his attacks on the Jews. Which one was it there? Was it Pol Pot? Yeah. What country? I can't remember the country. Cambodia. Wasn't Cambodia. It? And that was that was huge. That was huge. That was millions and millions. <laughs> remember, it's not just governments, it's human institutions. Right. Yeah. So how about human institutions that advocate violence as a way to get what they want? Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Those People that uh, didn't like the uh, Supreme Court's decision on Roe versus Wade and demonstrated not just outside of churches and institutions, but went to the high the the court judge's house and demonstrated out there and threatened the judge's lives. What about Native Americans and yep. boarding schools? That why they don't teach history anymore. Yep. So so people don't know the young kids now. Don't know what happened in World War One or mm -hmm. all the wars before us. Yep, I would say so. Any of those who flout our constitutional rights and think they're above the law? These were all localized things that happened at one time. What we're talking about here eventually will spread and will pretty much consume the whole globe, including, including our country. We already see the beginnings of it now. And it's only going to get worse and gain more power. On uh, your study guide there, there's this note and I copied it word for word from the Concordia commentary on Revelation. I thought it was uniquely insightful. Uh, Dr. This is from Dr. Brighton. The beast represents and symbolizes every human authority and everything of human nature that the dragon who is Satan can corrupt and control in his warfare against the woman who is the church and her offspring. These things include political, governmental, social, economic, philosophical, and educational systems, as well as individuals. No one entity or person at any given time in history will exhaust what this beast signifies. Remember, it's, it's representing something. It's hard to put one single name on it. It represents many things throughout history. Well, a personage like Hitler or Stalin might for a time and in a particular region epitomize what the beast represents, that personage will not exhaust such representation. Other human forces and people too will be at work under, beside, or apart from such typical fulfillment of what the beast symbolizes. And the beast symbolize, or what the beast symbolizes will be worldwide at all times and not present only where the epitomized human individual or organization exists. So we look at these various things as examples for us to understand, but keep in mind, they're not just confined to that. Sounds like Gavin Newsom. About, what about him? All the crazy stuff he's doing in California. If he's working against the church and what we believe in confess, then yes. Uh, verse four, and they will worship the dragon. Verse 8, and all who dwell on earth will worship him. So once again, who's the dragon? Satan. Who are they who will worship the dragon? Unbelievers. Yep. All who dwell on earth whose name has not been written before the foundation in the world uh, of the life of the book uh, uh, of the book of life of the Lamb. So as best we kind of review, what does that mean? What is the book of life of the Lamb who was slain? The Bible. Yes. What back, back, back to where it was. Sure. Um, I was reading the line, and it was allowed to make war on the saints and mm -hmm. to conquer them. Yeah. It, uh, 
How's it going to conquer all those saints? Attack the church. Keep in mind, this is not just physical, it's spiritual. Okay. It can be physical. Okay. Got to the scary stuff yet? Mm. Well, scary. we'll get to that. <laughs> okay. I want to talk about who they are that are going to worship the beast. So we said it's those whose names haven't been written in the book of life of the Lamb. Uh, this helps us with that. Uh, somebody want to read these books from Luke 10, chapter 17 to 20. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 to 20. <laughs> 72 returned with joy saying lord even the demons are subject to us in your name then he said to them i saw satan fall like lightning from heaven behold i have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you nevertheless do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven who are these whose names were written in heaven? Believers. 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 72 that he sent out to preach the gospel ahead of him. But you're right, not just that 72, we who believe in the gospel, who ministers the church, your name is written in heaven. One other place to look. Uh, Change on your uh, outline that says uh, Revelation 3 8. This is actually verse 5. It should be Revelation 3 5. Does somebody Please. care to read this? The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Who is it that's clothed in a white garment? What was that symbolic of? Do you remember? What? What were you clothed with that white garment? Baptism. baptism. Those that are sealed in the faith from baptism have the white garment. It's Christ's robe of righteousness that covers all of your sin. And those that have that robe of righteousness, where is your name written? So what is this book of life? It's symbolic for something. It's symbolic for all the names that God knows that have been in faith with him, that are in faith to him now, and will die in faith. The past, the present, and to come. All believers. A book, because otherwise people at John's time wouldn't remember, wouldn't be able to understand it. Us, we might think of it as being on a hard drive or on a computer <laughs> or in the cloud. God doesn't need those things. The book of life is who God knows, believes in him, and will die in faith towards him. All of those. It's important to remember, not just those that believe right now. People whose names in the book of life might not be confessing or believing in him now, but he knows before they pass, they will come to faith in him by the work of the Holy Spirit and the gospel. They will not worship the dragon. Because they worship Christ. Instead. But people will worship the dragon. They'll worship the beast. Uh, why will they worship these things? Since the beast represents human institutions, what does it mean that people will worship a human institution? You ever think about that? Well, what is worship? Fine. Let's look at uh, Psalm 50. <clears throat> favorite verses of mine. So many care to read these. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and perform your vows to the most high and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. What do we do in worship? Praising God. A sacrifice of thanksgiving. As Christians, what do we vow? We are sinners. We vow that, but that's a confession. But what do we vow because we're sinners? What do we hold by faith? That we're believers. So by faith, we hold that Jesus forgives us because of his death and resurrection. We vow to love God and love each other. How do we call upon him in the day of trouble? Prayer. 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 
and he promises he will deliver us. And when we call upon him in the day of trouble, we glorify him. That's how we worship God, right? When you're in trouble, you turn to God. You seek his help first. Except, do we do that? I love that liturgy where we sing Thanksgiving, you know? I don't know about you and your life, but I sometimes will turn anywhere and everywhere before I turn to God. First, I'll turn to myself. How can I fix this problem? <laughs> Government, aren't they supposed to fix problems? We just need to elect the right guy. <laughs> oh, listen to his promises. He'll fix everything for us. You'll change as you get older. <laughs> Believe me. As your faith is strengthened each day, sooner or later you're doing it automatically and you don't think of self so much. Where should we turn first? I mean, all those things can be helpful. I mean, I need a guy to fix my car. I'm not just going to sit there with my Bible open and pray that God will come down with his hand and fix it. <laughs> but if I'm wondering who can I trust, I can go to my own head. I can go on Google and look at the reviews and stuff. Although if somebody's smart enough, they can have a bunch of fake people come and make a whole bunch of good reviews. Can I turn to God first in prayer about that? Yeah. Do I? No. Yeah. Don't always. Any human institution, any government that you put your trust in and look to them to take care of you, you are in effect worshiping them. When you don't turn to God first. When you see all of those things as being gracious gifts from him, the government being his hand to protect us and guide us and keep us safe, now you're worshiping God. Only if you see them as a manifestation of his reign and rule here on earth. You've got a president that claims to be a Christian. Oh, I'll listen to whatever he says. No. Mm -hmm. I'll let you listen to him up to a point until he tells you to stop obeying God. Then you better stop listening. You better stop obeying. But we can put our faith and trust in not just in government and not just in presidents and people on the boob tube, actors, people with a voice, sports stars. I mean, what the heck do they know about anything outside of sports yet we'll put our trust in what they say, opinions they have about things that have nothing to do with sports? All of these are ways that I'm not saying that when you do that, you're actually worshiping the beast, but you're sure it's not opening the door for that. I'm guilty of it too. I don't always turn to the Lord first, but that's really who we should turn to. And when we find we haven't, we turn and ask him for forgiveness and God smacks us around then, right? No, no. He forgives always. Just some examples of how you might worship the beast. I'm sure there's a lot more. But anytime you post your trust in anything that's not the Lord, you're in effect worshiping. <clears throat> I'll say so. Uh, they worship the they worship the dragon for he had given the authority to the beast, and they worship the beast as well, saying, "Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it?" What kind of attitude is that when you say, "Who can fight against it?" Jesus. What yeah, kind of attitude is that that would say that? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh well, that's that's what they're going to do. So it's what happens. Someone who has resigned himself. How about resign themselves to the lesser of two evils? How about if you can't beat them, join them? That's the same kind of attitude, isn't it? Got to vote for somebody. And I'm not saying that is true. You got to vote for somebody. Just for that person that you had to vote for, don't put your complete trust in. Pray for him. There we go. Bingo, Reverend Art. Pray for them. Whether you voted for him or not, if they're in office, pray.
pray mightily for them. Pray he'll turn and do God's will. We should be careful what we resign ourselves to, especially in the name of supporting those who work against God's will. Mm -hmm. That means any particular political party or person, don't align yourself with a political party. There is no Christian political party. They're not. <laughs> All of them have things that stand against something we believe in. Whether it's things like transgenderism, abortion, same-sex marriage, whether it's loving and helping migrants. Does Jesus call us to do that? To love people we don't know? To love people who are escaping hard times in their own country, trying to join up with their families? He doesn't want us to love those people, does he? Yeah. I mean, after all, they don't look like me. They don't talk like me. They're not Americans. Does Jesus really want me to love them? Yep. Yes, he does. There is no Christian political party. Well, Germany has what they call a Christian Democratic Party. I don't know what their platform is, but that's their name. We should have a, a third party Christian party. Reverend Art, you go for it, we'll vote for you. I can't hardly see. <laughs> they can't either. <laughs> <laughs> Just be careful who you align yourself with. Align yourself first with God. That's right. And then whoever you're going to look at, prayer. Prayerfully. Prayerfully make a decision. Know your scripture. Know what God says. Tom, did you have something? No, I'm just trying to digest everything and put it in order. Not there. <laughs> yeah. one, one, of the, one of the ways that I, I think we people worship the beast is they'll know somebody stands against things that are the church stands for, but they're going to do things that are beneficial to me. Follow it. Good for me now. Is that what God wants? What's good for me now? No. Does he want me to care about what's good for somebody else? Yes. Yes. For those that are migrants? Yeah. For the unborn baby in the womb? Yeah. For the little child who doesn't know any better and is being taught that transgenderism and homosexuality is okay? Yeah. He wants me to love all of them. In fact, who am I supposed to put first? God first, and who comes second? Isn't it me? Your neighbor. It's them, and me third. We're at time. What is John, one more, what is John warning us about when he writes the beast was given a mouth to utter blasphemies against God? <laughs> what are blasphemies against God again? Lies. Lies. Lies against who God is, who his church is, what they believe and confess, that Jesus is the Lord and Savior, that Jesus loves everyone, that his church should love everyone. So this beast, these governments and human institutions will all accuse the church of not being what it says it is, and Jesus is not being who he claims to be. We will stop there for tonight. Any comments or questions you had that I rolled past and we didn't have a chance to talk about? I've asked a question, but I can't remember. I was just looking at <laughs> the same thing. <laughs> Did we start to get a little scary tonight? No. Yeah. No. We should be. <laughs> should we be afraid? You should oh. be respectfully fearful. Yes. In, in that these things haven't come up to America yet, to the United States. Yes. They will. Sure. They're already sure. here now. Uh, persecution like that goes on in North Korea and in the Islamic countries, it's not just going to be there. It's going to hit here. 
Uh, well, I think one of the things that I think I'm taking away from all of this is, and if I say, well, I don't think that we're at the scary stuff yet. I think it's more of a situation of to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Mm -hmm. And if we're aware that these things are going to happen, then we shouldn't be afraid of them when they do happen. We should be able to say, oh, okay. We were warned about this. We were we were given an advance word by being here and studying. And I think that's why I brushed it off as where's the scary stuff? I think it's because that's my point of view. It's there. And when it comes to you, it's going to be scary. But you're going to turn in faith towards Christ and he's going to walk with you through it. Just to say as a Christian, I don't need to be scared. That's pretty haughty. These are difficult things. Think not just about somebody making you suffer. Think about them. I, I told you the story about the organist. Um, I think it was in Serbia. Oh, tell the story again. Uh, Dr. Brighton, who uh, wrote the commentary, uh, in, early in his career when he was ordained, uh, he was in Europe, I think in a church in, uh, in England somewhere. And he had an organist, a man from Serbia who never really talked a lot. He was very quiet, uh, very downcast. He was by himself, didn't have a family, didn't have a wife. And uh, understood more when he finally found out his story, where he was from. Uh, after World War II, the Soviets came in and they rounded everybody up in the small village he lived in. And they wanted to know, all right, who are the Christians? Stand forward. And he was the organist of the church there in, in that town, and he stood forward. And a Russian soldier walked up and put his gun to his temple and clicked it and said, okay, deny Christ. And his wife and his kids were standing there looking and she said, no, don't deny Christ. Even if he kills you, don't deny Christ because we will see you in eternal life. And he looked at the Russian soldier and said, I, I refuse. I cannot. I can only admit my faith in Christ. And the Russian soldier took his gun away walked over and grabbed his wife, pulled her to the center, put the gun to her head and looked at him and said, now, now do I Christ. Is that scary? Yes. She looked at him and said, no, don't, no matter what happens to me, keep your faith and we will be together in eternal life. Said no, he pulled the trigger, shot his wife dead, and as he watched, shot his kids and killed them. And the Russian soldier said, now, go live by your faith. And he lived with that the rest of his life. That's scary. That's scary. But with faith in Christ, we can get through it. He's dead now. He'll be standing on the last day in the presence of his wife and his kids. Forever. And none of that will be remembered anymore. These are the kind of things that uh, the beast will be allowed to do. Not to everybody, but to some. And you're right, Tom, we do need to be prepared. These are heavy things. Like I said, I wish I could preach a Joel Oldstein message to you. All God wants is for you to be successful and be happy. Have a great job. Oh, you don't have that yet? No, just keep trying. Just keep loving. Send me your money. <laughs> Send me your money. That's the point. You gotta have, you gotta have a job for you have money. <laughs> there, there's some more we need to learn, and, and there's some more scary things. But are you kind of getting the picture now? But we can have hope. Once again, the church was already at this time. They were suffering this. This was the case in the Roman Empire. The John, the people John was writing to, those churches were facing life or death issues. And he wrote this not to scare them. They were already in the middle of it to bring them comfort and peace. As Dr. Brighton said in one of his classes, right, Christ wins at the top of every single page of Revelation. Keep that in mind. Christ wins, Christ wins, Christ wins. And as a believer in Christ, you will too. In the meantime, it's all things that should make us want to stay in faith, stay in the word, keep studying the word, hold fast to Jesus alone. Any other comments or questions? The pastor, even Peter denied Christ three times. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we get in those situations. I mean, I, I, you just don't know what you would decide at that time. Would I be a Peter or would I be? Even if you are a Peter, if you repent, are you forgiven? Even for denying Christ publicly? Well, I'm thinking of your friend that lost his wife and kids. Yeah. You can also say like Christ did, Satan, get ye behind me. Yeah. We won't always be faithful in standing. I mean, I'm not. There's been times when I've caved in on my faith walk out of fear of persecution and not even being dead, just what people well, might say about to your it. kids, you know, you just... I... Mm -hmm. It would be a very hard thing, wouldn't it? It would be very hard. But when we fail, there's forgiveness. It, it was a big deal even in, in Rome. Uh, I don't remember what part of history it was, but uh, there was a time when persecution came and a lot of, I think maybe it was right before uh, the first Christian emperor came. Before that, a lot of people had denied being Christians to not, to not be killed. And so now you have uh, Constantine. Constantine comes to power and people that, that, that didn't cave in, that stayed true to Christ, they didn't want to welcome these people back that denied the faith just to avoid persecution. And at that time, the leaders in the church says, no, Christ forgives them, we forgive them, we welcome them back. It's only one sin that's not forgiven and that's the sin of unbelief. Mm -hmm. Good, any other questions, comments? Keep preaching, brother. <laughs> I wanna leave you in a good place. Uh, what our future holds, I don't know, but I know who holds the future. And the one who's sitting at the right hand of God and ruling is the one who died on the cross and rose for you. And everything he allows to happen is for you. Not necessarily for your temporal good, but for your eternal good. And he will allow anything and everything to happen in your life that keeps you connected to Christ. Let's pray. Thank you. Gracious God, these are heavy things that we think of. None of us want to see them happening in our lifetime. We thank you for the peace and the comfort we've had and the ability as the church in this country to be able to do what we do and not face severe persecution. We see it starting to come, Lord. We ask that you would hold back the winds of destruction, that you would allow us to keep preaching the word and working. Help us to see this as a, as a thing that needs to happen, as, as an urgency to it. Because the freedom that we have now might not always be there. When we have that freedom, Lord, move your church to be gospel witnesses. And even when the persecution comes, help us to stand as witnesses, even though it might be to our detriment. And still us with that kind of faith and that kind of hope that we find only in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Peace be with you. Peace. Also with you. Yeah. See you Sunday. Yeah. Sunday.